Welcome back, everyone. This week, we have, yet again, more bullish news for the uranium sector and for the uranium investors out there. Sprout Physical Uranium Trust announces filing of a new preliminary base shelf prospectus and consideration of structural changes. In this video, we're going to discuss this, a couple of different people's takes on it, which are positive takes, as well as takes that seem reasonable and practical, as well as a couple of answers to your questions like, does this mean that SRUUF will get uplisted to the exchanges, which might not be the best news for that, but we'll get into that. But before we get into that any farther, let's do a quick recap on the past week in the uranium sector insofar as a few different names and ticker symbols. <clears throat> Last week, we had the Cameco news coming out on last Sunday about production cuts. So what's happened since then? Well, Cameco opened down from Friday's close, but it actually ended the week up. So you could just call it sideways. So Cameco really didn't react to that news within the first week, I understand. Many of our timelines and in investing is much longer than a week. Hopefully so. So that kind of went sideways. The Sprout Physical Uranium Trust over the market, SRUUF, I could have got the Canadian listed one, but I didn't. Because most people aren't trading that one if you are trading it. And brokerage accounts like TD Ameritrade limited your ability to trade this. Like that's That's actually one reason why I bought... URNM and not Sprout Physical Uranium Trust was because TD Ameritrade wouldn't let me and I wasn't I wasn't going to call in the order even though they actually had good good service so anyway Sprout Physical Uranium Trust actually closed down for the week which is interesting because you would think I mean of course it popped on the news but if you put in a market order for the beginning of market you'd be down 1.85% on the week. Then Sprout Uranium Miners, sideways action. You could say up, down, it's pretty much sideways. And then Sprout Junior Uranium Miners is pretty much sideways. So on that news, everything essentially traded sideways. So although the news might have been bullish for the spot price and incentivizing utilities to start signing term contracts, the stocks reacted, well, not really at all. I like this chart. A nice uh, basing pattern, if you will. A 15-year base, and, and now it's breaking out of this base. Make, make of it what you will. Interesting chart. And then you could, you could ask, you say, wow, we're going to break out. I, I should load up the boat, boat now. But if we're going to start going off of technical analysis and it is breaking out, you could say, then might it do a cup and handle pattern? In that case, then we could see some retracement of such things, but I don't know. I'm not trading uranium based upon a 15 year base breakout. So first we'll get into Cuppy. If you don't follow him, probably should. And we'll discuss his comments and then we'll discuss Kevin's comments on this topic as well, because Quite frankly, they can put things more articulately, more succinctly than I can, as, as opposed to me fumbling around and stumbling over my words in some verbose manner. So we'll just give credit where credit's due and say what they have to say. Cuppy says, this is very bullish for Sput, but there's nuance. Limited redemption is designed to ensure that the discount cannot permanent... Oh, my apologies. We need to go back. I actually need to tell you what this is. <laughs> so the Sprout Physical Uranium Trust announces filing of new preliminary base shelf prospectus in consideration of structural changes. As disclosed in the new preliminary base shelf prospectus, the trust is actively considering the introduction of a limited redemption feature on a net on a not less than annual basis. The implementation of limits on future treasury issuances of new 
trust units, and other measures with the objective of having the trust units trade more consistently with its net asset value. These considerations are, in part, the result of ongoing discussions with staff at the Ontario Securities Commission regarding the trust and its physical uranium holdings, as well as feedback from investors regarding the trust and its operations. There is currently no definitive timeline for the completion of these ongoing considerations and discussions, and no dis decisions have been reached at this time. There can be no assurance that any changes to the trust, including the introduction of such a redemption feature, the implementation of limits on future Treasury issuances or any other measures, will be proposed, approved, or implemented. The Trust does not intend to make any further public comment regarding the ongoing considerations and discussions until they have been completed or where Sprout Asset Management, on behalf of the Trust, determines that further disclosure is required by law or stock exchange rules, or is otherwise deemed appropriate. So, put simply, investors, and especially institutional investors, are either scared to buy this, because of the potential discount to NAV, there's been multiple times where they have a 5, 10, 15% discount to NAV. And, and that concerns people because it's not tracking in line with the physical market spot prices. And investors, institutional investors, are getting tired of it going nowhere while the underlying commodity is going up and to the right, so to speak. So between institutional investors pushing on them and the Securities Exchange Board pushing on them, maybe some changes will occur, which will then help while people feel more safe and comfortable and confident investing in it, in that particular vehicle or any of those vehicles. So with that said, Cuppy's comments. Limited redemption is designed to ensure that the discount cannot permanently widen past a certain threshold say 5%. Plus is limited to industry players. Plus only certain limited windows of redemption. This is designed so that the trust never overwhelms the physical market with selling. I believe this will help to build liquidity while providing a release valve during times of market stress. During periods of selling in SPUT, a physical trader can short physical and buy SPUT and then settle that trade either by unwinding in the market or one of the limited redemption windows. This will better tether SPUT to physical by creating arbitrage opportunities. Which is actually a big deal because, well, Bitcoin, as we'll get into in a moment, a lot of people were using grayscale Bitcoin trust as an arbitrage opportunity and that's what a lot of institutes I mean it's more sophisticated than what the retail investors do but it's it's quite relevant he goes on to say remember the biggest risk to sput was that the spread would blow out and it would act like GBTC that's grayscale Bitcoin trust with this potential now removed, institutional investors can step in and know that they'll receive approximately the NAV back on an exit. This had always been the biggest pushback. It also means that in an up market, the trust will increase approximately with spot market prices. Still many details to work out from a regulatory standpoint, but this is a huge step in the right direction. Additionally, the shelf is now $250 million with a $125 million drawdown. This means that the trust will be more limited in terms of selling and may allow prices to increase beyond 1% premium to NAV. For those who don't know, once, well, even currently, once it gets above NAV, they issue more, buy, buy more uranium with it, and they just collect more uranium under management. But by allowing that to get above the premium, well... It's nice for the shareholders. Ultimately, these are baby steps towards the ultimate goal of having the trust act a lot more like other Sprout Trusts, which track NAV, net asset value, if you don't know what NAV is. I really like it, even if some details need to be worked out. This sets the trust up for institutional adoption and is also a necessary step towards an eventual U.S. listing as well. Now we await further details. Note how SPUT tightened to NAV 
over the past few weeks. Market seems pleased. I know I am. Now we'll get to that U.S. listing comment in a little bit, so don't forget it. So this is the discount to NAV that he's referencing in the grayscale Bitcoin. It got down to a 48.3% discount to NAV at the end of 2022. Now that causes a lot of investors to shy away knowing that you can have that kind of a, a difference and, and people just don't want to participate. And matter of fact, right now it's still 17% below NAV. And, and remember, so it went from <clears throat> December 27th, 2022. So we'll just call that from the beginning of the year, it's gone from being negative 48% of NAV to negative 17% of NAV, while the stock itself has gone up 135%. And while Bitcoin has gone up 55% year to date. So year to date, Bitcoin's gone up 55%. So just with Bitcoin going up 55%, one could say that the NAV should have closed. It should be trading at a premium, if anything. But it's not. It's still at a negative 17%. So that those are the kinds of fears that people have. Because essentially, <clears throat> as the spot price of the commodity, in this case Bitcoin, goes up, the vehicle that you chose to express your view in doesn't go up with a one-to-one -one correlation. And, and that scares a lot of people away from participating. <clears throat> Kevin says, sh shares a lot in similar sentiment to Cuppy. So a comment that he's replying to is, elephant in the room. What do you guys think about Sputz becoming a seller of physical uranium thanks to the proposed redemption mechanism? I get the feeling Sprott is going to wreck uranium investors' portfolios once more for old time's sake. <clears throat> this is a snide, cynical, sarcastic, unsophisticated uh, paradigm of what's going on. It's an oversimplified view. Oh, Sprout can sell uranium, we're all doomed. Like, that kind of mental modeling of the world is not going to help you be a successful investor. I can assure you of that. Now, it's a worthwhile question to ask, but you can see the little uh, sarcastic and at best, or at best facetious comment with their disdain towards Sprout wrecking the uranium market and their portfolios. Like, So, Kevin says, this is not what is going to happen. I know well that there are piles of huge mutual funds and even gigantic pension funds that can't own physical uranium. The prospectus of many funds like these prevent them from owning future contracts and other exotic ways of getting exposure to uranium. But they can buy SPUT, only they haven't been willing to commit 100 or 200 million or more to physical uranium because of a fear of getting caught and having to sell the shares at a potentially huge discount to market. But now they will be buyers, insofar as Sprout fig figures this all out. Also, utilities will be way more likely to chip away at Sput and own it as a hedge when it ever, whenever it's at a discount to Spot. Bottom line, the discount will be tightened up. The liquidity will improve, the sector will become more investable, and capital will flow. So less discount to NAV, more confidence in investing in that vehicle, causes more fund flows to come into that industry and therefore prop the price up. We're already seeing that to some extent with the bigger names like NextGen, Cameco, with, with Druck and Miller and Kathy Woods buying Cameco and other people buying NextGen. People's going after the large cap names. That doesn't mean that the junior miners are suffering or not moving in line, but if they can get control over minimizing the discount to NAV, it, it's anything I can say is an understatement to how big of a deal that is and how beneficial that is to the market as a whole. So to the New York Stock Exchange uplisting or 
cross-listing. John Quakes, another worthwhile follow, said, The SEC denied Sput's New York Stock Exchange listing based on two major disqualifiers. First was the lack of a redemption mechanism, and second was unavailability of intraday real-time uranium price that investors can use to make their buy-sell decisions during a trading day. The redemption mechanism is complicated given that, unlike physical gold and silver trusts, ordinary investors cannot take delivery of the most highly regulated commodity, uranium. There is no immediate solution to the issue of a real-time definitive spot U308 price, so unless that changes, there is still no chance of a spot New York Stock Exchange listing. And why would they bother spending millions to get one? Sput on the TSX, Toronto Stock Exchange, has grown sixfold to nearly four billion just fine. One could argue that Sput should in fact avoid getting entangled with the SEC and New York Stock Exchange in order to prevent any future intervention by the US government in its operations and holdings. As a Canadian company with no US listing, it gains a certain amount of protection from US parties who may seek to gain legal access to its 70,000 plus drums of yellow cake, in my honest opinion. Now that's worthwhile to think about. That's saying they might not even be incentivized to do such things. Now, I don't want to be too cynical here, but they also do run an assets under management type business. So why would they not want more assets under management? And you could say, well, because of the headache and the United States trying to usurp their authority and control over that uranium for their own usage. So we'll see, but that's a, that's a little ways away, let's just say. So on to, I hate for this to be so sudden. I really need to track where my slides are better. Uh, so on to my, so, so that's, that's the end of that. If you were here for the uranium and that's it, uh, that's the chair leading I have for the week. Looking good. So on to the next segment, which is Stock Portfolio Review of the Week. I made some new additions to the portfolio. And, uh, you know, good idea or bad idea, that's, that's the question. So what did I do? I bought real estate investment trusts. Since the trust is, we're talking about trust so much, I bought some. So what did I buy? I bought... VNO Vernado Realty Trust. I bought I bought KRC Kilroy Realty Corp. And I bought CUZ Cousins Property. That's what I did. All right. Why did I do it? Yeah. Good question. I will say that. I was talking to someone a while ago, months ago, and and I said to them, and it was more of a tongue-in-cheek joking kind of thing, but I said that when Zoom starts, kind of like when Japan reopens and restarts their nuclear facilities is when you should buy uranium because that, that will signal a sentiment, a sentiment change and inflection in the industry. It might not be the inflection, because maybe that happened beforehand, but it's definitely a sign of confidence. So I said, tongue-in-cheek, to, to someone, you know, when Zoom starts bringing people back to the office, is RTO, as they're calling it, return to office. When they start returning people to the office, I'll buy some REITs. So, <laughs> sure enough. Zoom is making people return to the office. I, I think it's just two days a week, but I don't want to say just two days a week, but two days a week. And office REITs, which the three I listed are all office REITs, so let's go back to my portfolio. KRC, West Coast, VNO, East Coast, CUZ, Cousins. So Vernado's East Coast, Kilroy is West Coast, Cousins is Sunbelt. And they're all office REITs. 
So I kind of got the map covered. I picked the best players in each regional demographic. They're bombed out sectors. They've they've rebounded. Vernado, from its intra-year low so far this year, Vernado's up, I want to say 100%. I want to say Kil, Kilroy is up, I don't know, 40%, 50%. I want to say Cousins is up 20%, 30% from, from that intra-year low. I, does it double bottom? Does it crash below that? I've been saying for weeks that I'm nervous about looking at the Treasury and how it looks like it wants to break out. And then if yields go screaming, then this is not going to be good. Uh, they're, they're all... These, these are not the most Delta plays. Like Hudson Pacific Properties, HPP. They slashed their dividend uh, in Q1. Let's call it 40-50%. And then in Q2 on the conference call, they announced that they're, they're removing it. So... You know, when, when a sector is down 50 to 80%, people's handing back keys, dividends are getting slashed. My thesis, and, and I don't know when to execute on it, quite honestly. <clears throat> let, let me give you, maybe I should have started with this. I should have. I think work from home. I can't tell you how wrong. Now, I need to go back. We need to go back to, call it sometime early 2022, late 2021. And everybody's talking about work from home is the new thing. And, and I, I thought, no. And I, I honestly, I have a framework that's going, that's beyond this, but just a psychological, behavioral understanding of how human beings work. And I thought it was all BS. Like I don't, I, I not, I did not think. The, the, I haven't felt this bullish on something. You know, I, I'm bullish on offshore oil. I'm bullish on uranium. Uh, I'm structurally bullish on home builders, even though maybe they've got overextended in the short term and they're they're making concessions and things like that. But Monster Energy Drink, back in 2010. I started seeing it pop up, pop up here, pop up there. I was like, man, this would be a good investment. And I never I never did anything with it. And then I remember the first time I saw Elf Beauty brands in, in the store that I shop for groceries at. And I thought, this is the time to buy this. And I didn't. And man, that, that, that sucks because those two have gone up a lot. And... In a similar fashion, I think the work from home thing is a joke and wishful thinking. The problem is, is how do you express it? Just because something might be true doesn't mean that there's a way to express it. So one might say that a good way to express it is through office rates. I'm not so sure that's the case, to be honest with you. It's not like you're going to get a 5x return, not on the names I picked. What did Vernado top out at? 100? So it's at 25? So so that's not a 5X. None of these are 5Xs. Cousins property, be lucky to get 100% out of that in a few years. So between that and they're not heavily, deeply discounted. Even though they are, in a sense, they're still not. Insofar as the potential to get a 5 or 10 bagger. And, like, there were hotels after September 11th that just capitulated in price. Those things were 5 and 10 baggers. These are not 5 and 10 baggers. Not from where I've purchased them. And between that and structural inflation and higher interest rates and debt wall maturities, I'm not confident there is a play for this. At least not expecting those kinds of returns. But I kind of held myself accountable to my tongue-in-cheek comment about Zoom. So if you look at the, oh, Castle office, was it barometer? Castle, I don't know, office barometer, something like that. 
Office occupancy has been trading at around 50% since the beginning of 2022. Really hasn't gone down, really hasn't gone up, just trading sideways. But the Sun Belt, pretty much where there's smaller or shorter commute times, less traffic, and growing populations, office occupancy is going back up much quicker than coastal regions, high traffic regions, uh, gateway cities, you know, the biggest cities. What, what, what are they there? The top six, six largest cities in the United States is uh, San Francisco, Los Angeles, New York, Washington, D.C., Boston, and Chicago. And I'm not, I can't say I'm really bullish on those places. And then there's so much, you know, you could say, why did I buy KRC, Kilroy, when West Coast and all the crap that's going on there, homelessness, drugs, uh, Newsom, and so on and so forth, and deteriorating. And one of the reasons I'm bullish Joe in the Sun Belt is because of the capital flight from the East and West Coast. You know, it's, it just seems like a sentimental play, and I don't know. If, if I lose my ass on it, so be it. But I guess I'm willing to lose my ass on it. Like I said, when, when a sector's down 50, 80 percent, dividends are getting slashed, keys are getting handed back, uh, private equity is getting gated from being able to remove their funds, so on and so forth. That's, that's definitely not a top. Now, that doesn't mean it's a bottom either. But it's definitely not a top. And and some are doing better than others. I brought up Hudson Pacific properties a moment ago. I kind of thought, and I still might, I don't know. They own office on the West Coast. And they also have studios, movie studios, TV studios. And with the, what, Writers Guild strike going on in Hollywood, they're losing money from that. And it's hurting sentiment even more. And now they're shoring up capital by completely removing the dividend. And, and well, huh, trying to make do in a higher interest rate environment. They're, uh, 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 who was it? It was, uh, was it Piedmont, PDM, I think is the ticker symbol. They just, they had a $400 million principal payment coming due in 2024. And they refinanced it. They, re they refinanced the whole thing. And it is incredible, the prices. Because, you know, after the whole banking fiasco, higher interest rates, credit lending standards are tightening, so on and so forth. This is why people keep on talking about work from... It's very interesting. You read a bunch of articles about work from home, or I'm, I'm sorry, about REITs, office REITs. People are more focused on work from home than the massive interest rate spike that's happened over the past couple of years. Like, I, I think work from home is a joke, and I think it'll normalize at a higher level, especially in the Sun Belt region. Like, the interest rate's the problem. So, back to Piedmont... They refinanced this loan. It was a, what was it, a, a, a 4.1, 4.45% was the loan. Now they refinanced it at 9.15%. That's a 500 basis point spread. That's going to add an additional, what, I, I think $20 million per annum of interest expense. And that's going to eat into the funds from operation. And it just so happens that the funds from operation or the just the funds from operation is kind of where the dividend comes from. So with people having to roll over their debt in that kind of environment, I mean, that's, that's cannabis type usury debt loan prices. It's like nine point, I mean, nine percent. I mean, that's what, SOFR plus four percent. I mean, my goodness. I mean, so far is at, at 5.3. So, I mean, we're, we're like, that's that's tough. And, and then the more, you know, EBITDA, the debt, higher leverage plays, the worse it's going to be. And it just, you know, if, if you're in an office, it, 
none of it's looking good. I mean, I'm not saying anything positive. I, I think work from home's a joke. I think treasuries might break out. If they do, maybe I'll have to hedge this position or just take the beating, double down. I don't know. But that's, I would say that's my thought. But it's, it's a beaten down sector. Eh, it's rebounded. I don't really like to buy on the rebound, but sometimes you got to wait for a knife to stop falling, even though the knife might start falling again. <clears throat> I'm not the most bullish on it. So it's one of those things that I might do well on and feel sick that I, I have a position in it the whole time. But I did say when Zoom, when Zoom starts bringing people back to the office, and I also think that my idea on it was that I thought Office would be a good buy. The way I kind of saw it playing out is that employers don't have negotiating leverage to get employees to come back to the office. And I thought that once unemployment starts ticking up, they can be able to get people to come back to the office. But the problem with that is, is if unemployment's ticking up, then we're probably in a recession. And if we're in a recession, then the market normally goes down. And if the market goes down, these things are going to go down. I just don't see any way around that. So, although, so, so when do you buy? That's the question. And, and if the market's going down, we're in a recession, then maybe the Fed cuts rates. But if the Fed's cutting rates, then that means that these office names, that might act as a buoyancy towards the office names, and they might not sell off as hard. So the question is, when do you buy? And seemingly my tongue-in-cheek expression that I was half-heartedly serious about is the time to buy. So that's what I did. Whether that's smart or not, uh, I don't have much confidence, as you can probably tell by all the things I've said and how normally when I buy something, I tell you all the bullish things and I bought something here, I'm telling you all the bearish things. So I'm not really sure what that indicates, but something worth looking at. Uh, with that said, I think I've gone on long enough here. Thank you for watching. Until next time.